Good morning, dear friends. Good to see you this morning. What a wonderful and beautiful day God has given us to be together, to worship him and praise his glorious name. I want to thank all of our brothers this morning who did such a wonderful job leading us in our worship to God. We appreciate you so much. I realize that today is first and foremost the Lord's Day. It is the day when we come together as God's children to worship him and praise him as our Heavenly Father. I realize this is first and foremost the Lord's Day, but at the same time it is also a day in our country in which we give some special recognition to fathers. And so to all of the godly and wonderful fathers in this room that I know and love so much, I certainly want to extend to you a happy Father's Day. May God bless you and may God bless your whole family. We appreciate all you do for your family. You are needed more than ever. You know, many of you know that a little over a week ago, my family and I returned from a vacation in the beautiful state of Hawaii. We actually visited two islands in Hawaii. We spent several days on Oahu and, and several other days on the big island. We had an incredible time and we made a lot of wonderful family memories. And while vacation is generally supposed to be a time of relaxation and rejuvenation, went in a place that I've never been before and I'm far away from home, my wife will tell you that much of the time on vacation, well, I'm stressed. I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I'm troubled, I'm always in possession of a heart that, that is racing. I rarely ever really relax, even on a vacation, because I'm constantly focused on keeping my family safe. I want to keep my family safe. I don't want my kids to get lost in the airport or at a shopping center or a souvenir store or a museum. I don't want either one of them to drown at the beach. I don't want to get in an accident in the rental car. I don't want anybody to get sick or, or, or injured. I don't want to end up in the wrong parts of town. And we're in a situation where the danger level rises and we're around a bunch of evil men who want to bring harm upon us. I want to keep, I want to keep my family safe. I want to bring my family back to Phoenix, Arizona in the same condition that they left. In fact, usually it is only when the plane lands at Sky Harbor and we got our bags and we're in our car and we're driving home and we finally walk through the front door of our house that I can then, now I can relax. Now I can excel and take a deep breath and thank God that he's blessed us to make it back safely. I think I can speak for every father and leader of a family this morning when I say that keeping our family safe is a task of the utmost importance. It is absolutely critical. It is something that we have to be focused on doing all the time. In fact, as each day passes by in the world in which we're living right now, doing that, keeping our family safe, it's becoming more and more difficult, right? It's, it's becoming extremely difficult. I mean, beyond keeping them safe on a, on a vacation, it is also increasingly becoming difficult to keep them safe in just day-to-day -day life. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but currently, brothers and sisters, we are living in a very dangerous and depraved world. Currently, we're living in a world that doesn't just have terrorists and school shooters and drug dealers and rapists, but it also has all kinds of, of spiritual dangers. It also is a world that has all kinds of, of spiritual troubles. It is a world that, that, that celebrates tolerance towards same-sex relationships and is hostile towards you and your family if you don't. It is a world that preaches to our young people that gender identity, their gender identity can really be whatever they want it to be. It is a world where many people have absolutely no respect for authority. They have no respect for the laws of the land. 
and those who are in positions to enforce those laws. It is a world where many people, unfortunately, have racism in their hearts. They have a lot of hatred in their hearts. And they don't believe in absolute truth. They don't, they don't value sacred relationships like, like marriage and sexual purity. In fact, in many people's minds, you can just live together without being married. That's equal. That's just as good as getting married. And let's not fail to mention the rising number of young people in our country who are being brainwashed to believe that there is no God. There is no creator. They're nothing more than a grand cosmic accident. There's nothing special about them as human beings. They were not made by God. They were not made in the image of God. They are nothing more than the product of nature and a lot of time and chance. That is why for a lot of people they believe there's nothing wrong with murdering thousands and thousands of unborn babies every single day. That is why for many people they believe that there's nothing wrong with terminating a pregnancy and refusing to take responsibility for your actions. You see, if there is no God, if there is no creator, if there is no supreme being, then that means that when it comes to, to unborn, unborn babies, we can, just, we can just squash them like cockroaches or just chop them down like trees. It's no big deal. That's the kind of world we're living in today. That's the kind of spiritually dangerous world that many of us are raising children in and we're trying to raise up to be soldiers for Jesus Christ. It reminds me of the last verse of the book of Judges. You remember the last verse of the book of Judges? Judges 21, 25. When summing up this time period in Israel's history, when summing up the time of the judges, it says in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Doesn't that remind you of our world today? Doesn't that remind you of 21st century America? Do we not also live in a time where for a lot of people, they don't respect God as the creator. They don't respect him as the king. And they're doing whatever they want to do. They're doing whatever they want to do in their own eyes. That's the kind of world we're living in today. That's the kind of world we're raising children in today. And the question is, what are we to do about that? What are we to do to keep ourselves and our families safe and uncontaminated by the poison that is found in such a spiritually depraved world? Well, that brings us to what I want to talk with you about this morning and our study from God's word. From those, for those of you who are members of this congregation, the Monte Vista Church of Christ. Remember what our theme this year as a church. Remember our theme this year as a church is hand to plow. Hand to plow. With this theme, our shepherds want us to commit ourselves to developing fertile and fruitful fields for God. In the, months of, in the months of February, March, and April, if you remember, we talked about plowing the field of the heart. We talked about planting proper seeds in our heart and cultivating those seeds and then enjoying the produce or, or the fruit from that process. Last month, we transitioned and we started talking about the field of the family. Brother Brian gave a lesson on seed planting in the family. And this morning, I want to follow Brother Brian's lesson by talking about the second step in the process. I want to talk about cultivation. I want to talk about entrenchment. I want to talk about growing and spiritually securing the family that God has blessed us with. In fact, I want to suggest that there are four things, four things that we're going to have to do. If we're going to cultivate and entrench and secure and grow and firmly root our families in a spiritually dark and dangerous world. How do we provide spiritual security to our family during times like this? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to stay connected. We're going to have to stay connected to God with our family. We're going to have to stay connected to God with our family through his word. Isn't that exactly what Moses told the Israelite parents in our scripture reading this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 6? Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 6, Moses said to the Israelite parents, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. 
and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and to your daughters. A New Testament equivalent passage to that is Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, where the Apostle Paul tells fathers, the leaders of the household, bring up your children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. It reminds me what we find in Acts the 10th chapter. Will you make your way to Acts chapter 10? And I hope you got your Bible with you this morning because we're, got to, we're going to work these Bibles pretty good. We got a lot of scriptures that we want to consider and we want to go to Acts the 10th chapter. Now, in our Bible class hour this morning, we, we said some things about Cornelius. We said that Cornelius was a Gentile man and he believed in the one true God. Well, Cornelius is also the first Gentile convert, right? He's the first Gentile Christian, the first Gentile to hear the gospel, believe it, and get baptized for the remission of sins. Well, if you remember from the book of Acts, God sent Peter to Cornelius to preach to him the gospel. Peter had to go to Cornelius and teach him the words of eternal life. But notice what the Bible tells us in Acts 10 and verse number 24. There the Bible says, on the following day, he, referring to the apostle Peter, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his, what? He called together his, his relatives, the Bible says, and his close friends. Notice what the scripture is telling us about Cornelius. Notice how in addition to making provisions for himself to connect with God through his word, Cornelius also made provisions for his family. He also made provisions for those closest to him. He also wanted the people closest to him to have the seed of the God's word planted and watered in their hearts. What an amazing scene that must have been. What an amazing scene it must have been for Peter to enter into the house of this Gentile man and see not only him, but his entire family gathered together in the living room to hear the word of God. I submit that living in a world like we're living in today, living in a world that is preaching and signaling so many ungodly messages to us and our families, we need to be creating moments like Cornelius. We need to be creating moments just like this. We need to be creating moments every single day to hear from God and grow with God and connect with God with our family. Practically speaking, we need to be sitting in the living room every day doing that Bible reading with our family. We need to be preparing for Bible classes with our family we need to be discussing the sermons that are presented here on sunday with our family we need to be texting bible verses and bible thoughts to our kids all throughout the day every single day we need to constantly be getting them to think about god's word all the time we need to understand that the bible not facebook not twitter not instagram not TikTok. no the bible is the only source of direct communication we have from God and we can't expect to be close with God and we can't, we can't expect our families to be close with God if we're not striving together to read his word and study his word and consider what his word has to say. We need to be connecting with God all the time through his word with our family. But not only do we need to be connecting with God through his word with our family, we also need to be connecting with God through prayer with our family. Prayer with our family. Go in your Bible, please, to Luke, the 11th chapter. Luke chapter 11. We read these verses several weeks ago in our Bible reading. And in Luke, the 11th chapter, the Bible says in verse number one, Luke 11 and verse one, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, I don't have time to pray with you. I'm not teaching you how to pray. Are you kidding me? God doesn't even want to hear from sinful men like you. That's what Jesus says in the next verse, right? Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day, each day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Notice how here we find Jesus praying, praying with the people closest to him. We find Jesus teaching the people closest to him how to pray. He taught the disciples how to pray. Jesus made time to do that. Now you put that with what you find in John the 17th chapter. Please go to John chapter 17 and look at verse number 13 because again we find Jesus praying. And in John chapter 17 and verse number 13, as Jesus prays to his father, he says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. There he's talking about, he's talking about the apostles. He says in verse 14, I have given them, the apostles, your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them, the apostles, out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So what do we find here? Well, here we see that in addition to praying with the people close to him and teaching them how to pray, Jesus also prayed for them. He prayed with the people closest to him, and he prayed for the people closest to him. It reminds me of another man in, in the Bible in the Old Testament. Please go to Job chapter 1. Look at Job chapter 1 and verse 1, please. Look at what the Bible says in Job chapter 1 and verse number 1. Job 1 and verse 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of fasting had completed their cycle, Joel would send and consecrate them. Rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now I know so often when we read these first few verses of Job, we like to focus on about the first three verses. We like to focus in on how the Bible speaks very highly of Job's character and how Job was a very wealthy man. Those are things we typically notice first when reading these verses, but for the purpose of this lesson, I want you to notice carefully verse number five. You see verse five? Notice how even though Job had a lot going on in his life, even though he had a big family, even though he had sons, he had daughters, he had a ranch that would even make somebody in West, in West Texas jealous. He had sheep, he had camels, he had donkeys, he had everything material-wise that a man could want and possess, and yet, even though he had all this stuff going on in his life, Job always, he always put first things first, didn't he? He always began every single day the very same way. He always began the day thinking about the spiritual problems that could impact his family, and he would pray about those things. He would do things like consecrate his children and offer sacrifices for his children. He would begin every single day addressing the spiritual needs of his family. The question is, fathers, fathers, are we being like Job? Are we doing the kind of stuff Job did? I want to suggest we certainly need to be doing that kind of stuff. We certainly need to be praying for our children. We need to be praying for our children above anyone else. We don't need to be sitting around as fathers waiting on other people to pray for our kids. We don't need to be sitting around waiting for the elders to pray for our kids. We don't need to be sitting around waiting for the deacons to pray for our kids. We don't need to be sitting around waiting for the preacher or the Bible class teachers or even seasoned saints here that we really admire to pray for our kids. No, if we're going to be like Job and if we truly care about the spiritual maturity, growth, and security of our children in these dangerous times, then we need to be praying for them first. We need to care enough to be praying for our kids. We need to care enough to talk to God 
about our kids and beg God to be with them and be with our spouse. We need to plead with God every single day to providentially work in the lives of our family and give them wisdom and protection and help them avoid the pitfalls of Satan. If we're going to provide some spiritual security for our family in these dangerous times, then we got to stay connected. We got to stay connected with God, with our family. But not only do we got to stay connected to God with our family, we also got to stay connected to our family. We got to stay connected with the other members of our family. There are several passages that make this point. God wants to make this point concerning marriage right away in the book of Genesis. I'm going to Genesis chapter 2. And remember, after God married Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, God declares what his will is for marriage. And he says in Genesis 2 and verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. As far as the children go, here's a great verse that can help us with this. Proverbs 29, 15, where the Bible says, but a child left to himself, a child left to his own. Well, he brings shame to his mother. Do you see how both of these passages connect to each other? You see how both of these passages, both of them involve time. They both involve an investment of time and energy and attention with our family. You see, just like cultivating a physical garden requires an investment of time, so does the field of the family. The field of the family also requires an investment of time. Now, we just read about how Job invested a lot of time addressing the spiritual needs of his family. The question only is, is what about us? How much time are we investing in our family? How much time are you investing in your family? How much time am I investing in my family? My friends, if we think that merely carving out an hour or two on a Saturday or a Sunday to be with our spouse and be with our kids and learn them and understand them and tend to their spiritual needs and security, if we think a couple of hours on a Saturday or Sunday is good enough to attend to those needs, then we're just fooling ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. We're telling a big fat lie to ourselves. It doesn't work that way when it comes to physical gardens and it also doesn't work that way when it comes to a family. It doesn't work that way. In the case of our children, as each day passes by and as the devil continues to try to assault them in so many different ways, but we got to understand that as parents, the moments, we, the moments we have to influence them and mold them and shape them, those moments are fleeting. They are passing away fast. They are going to be gone a lot sooner than we may realize. Our days of influence are dwindling. And if we don't want to look back on the time we had them in our home with great regret, then what we need to start doing is we need to start making the most of the time we have with them right now. We need to be making the most of the time we have with them right now while they're still in the home. Beyond making time to connect with God with our family, we also need to be making time to connect with our family on a personal level. We need to be making time for uninterrupted conversations with our spouse and prayer with our spouse and romance and intimacy with our spouse and just listening attentively to our spouse and their needs. We need to be making time for our spouse and we also need to be making time for those, for those children, for the fathers, for the fathers, the, the leaders of the family. You know what we have to do? We got to step up and we got to be real leaders. We got to be real spiritual leaders in our home. We don't need to be cowards and sitting back, letting the mama do all the raising and the spiritual training. God doesn't have time for that kind of stuff. We shouldn't have time for that kind of stuff. When we leave work, you know what we need to do? We need to really leave work. 
We need to leave work at work and we need to go home and be at home. We need to go home and be with our kids. We need to talk with our kids. We need to listen to our kids. We need to know exactly what their strengths and weaknesses are so we can train them up in the way they should go. We need to know who their friends are. We need to know who they're hanging out with, what they're doing on social media, who they're texting. We need to know what kind of erroneous stuff they may be getting brainwashed to believe at school. We especially need to be doing what Moses told the Israelite parents to do in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. Remember, Moses told those parents that in addition to teaching their children the word of God, they also needed to make, be making time to talk with them about the word. See, it's one thing to teach. It's another thing just to talk about it. We need to talk about God's word with our kids. We need to help our kids understand how the word of God applies to daily life and daily problems. If we're going to provide some spiritual security for our family, then we got to stay connected to God with our family. And we got to stay connected to the members of our family in a very personal and intimate way. And then thirdly, we also got to be stay, stay connected to our blessings with our family. We got to stay connected to these blessings God gives our family. Please go in your Bible to Joshua chapter 4, please. I'm going to Joshua the fourth chapter, and I want to show you something in Joshua. In Joshua the fourth chapter... The Bible says this in verse number one. I'm reading Joshua 4 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the, to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take a stone, take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you will say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. What's going on there in those verses? Well, there we find Israel making an effort to remember something, to remember a blessing that had come from God, like with what happened when they miraculously cross over the Red Sea after leaving Egyptian slavery, here we see God has blessed them to miraculously cross, cross over the Jordan River. God has blessed about two million people to miraculously cross over the Jordan River during a time of intense flooding. This crossing served as a sign from God that he was with them. And he loved them and he cared about them and he would fight for them and help them defeat every one of their enemies. He would not leave them, forsake them or abandon them. That is what this crossing signified. In fact, it helped them. And future generations remember this amazing act of God's grace. God commanded them to build a memorial. God commanded them to build a monument of stones. This was designed to help them remember an amazing moment when God blessed them to get through a very difficult moment. This monument or these memorial stones would help them stay connected to this blessing. It would help remind them of God's love and God's grace and God's power when things became difficult for them in their lives, whenever they felt compelled to believe that God doesn't love us, God doesn't care about us. Whenever they became afraid, whenever they started grumbling and going through very dark moments, whenever they got weak in their faith as they battled the tough people of Canaan, these memorial stones would remind them of what God had done for them by his power in the past and what he would continue to do for them by his power in the future. These memorial stones were designed to help God's people stay connected to his blessing. The question is, do you have this? 
Do you have a monument? Do you have a memorial stone beyond the Lord's Supper? Do you have something in your personal life that helps you stay grounded and humble and grateful and always mindful of an occasion when God got you through a rough moment in your life along with your family? I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story. Several years ago, back in 2014, when we were living in Middle Tennessee, we were on our way to dinner. We were on our way to Olive Garden to celebrate Genesius 30th birthday. On our way to dinner, we're going down Nashville Highway on our way to Spring Hill, Tennessee. And I did something foolish. I took my eye off the road for a second to look at something on my phone. And when I looked up, I saw that a, a small Chevy Spark had come to an abrupt stop at a red light. Now, I actually swer swerved by instinct, I guess, into the right lane to avoid hitting this Chevy Spark. And thankfully, no other car was coming in that lane, but I still hit the Chevy Spark. I hit the back passenger side, and I flipped that car into a ditch, and I totally destroyed the front of our vehicle. Now, thankfully, the driver of the Chevy Spark, he didn't get hurt. I didn't get hurt. Janicia didn't get hurt. Shawn Michael, who's in the back seat, he didn't get hurt. None of us, none of us got a scratch. God blessed us tremendously in a very dark moment. In fact, to remember that day, we, we made a memorial. We made a monument. You know what our monument was? I'll show you what the monument is. The monument is this Ninja Turtle. You know who the Ninja Turtles are? My son loves Ninja Turtles. I loved Ninja Turtles as a kid. This is Donatello. Shawn Michael was carrying Donatello in the back seat during that accident. And the impact was so strong that Donatello's stick flew out of his hand right onto the front dashboard. We decided to retire Donatello from crime fighting after that. <laughs> and we used him as a memorial stone in our home to help us always remember that blessing. Donatello helps us remember how God brought us safely through. He brought us safely through to the other side. His grace protected us so we could continue being a family and eventually bring faith into the world and so, we, and so we could be here today with you, these wonderful people here that keep doing God's work. We have a memorial stone for our family. And maybe you got a memorial stone Maybe you have something that helps you remember when God helps somebody in your family beat cancer. Maybe you have something in your family that helps you remember when a, a time when God spared somebody that you loved. Maybe you have something in your family that helps you remember the time when God blessed y'all to finally buy that new house. Or when God blessed somebody in the family to overcome an addiction. Or when God helped somebody in the family, maybe the entire family, like us, survive a bad car accident. Memorial stones are good. Memorial stone, stones keep us humble. They keep us grounded. They keep us focused and aware of God's presence in our lives. We need that. We need that, especially today. In a world that's just trying to eat us up. In a world where it's easy to become afraid and doubtful and overwhelmed by all the spiritual dangers out there. We need something to help us stay connected to God's blessings. We need to stay connected to God. We got to stay connected to our family. We got to stay connected to our blessings through memorial stones. And then and finally, let me close with this. We also need to stay connected to God's people. We got to stay connected to the family, the family of God. I'm going to one more place in my Bible this morning, please. Acts chapter 2. I want to show you something from the early church. The early church in Acts, the second chapter, 
And in verse 43, after telling us about how the church began with 3,000 people believing in Jesus and being baptized, the Bible says in Acts 2 and verse number 43, everyone, verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. What do we learn about the early church here? Well, here we see Luke is trying to tell us that the early church was connected. They were about relationships. They were about connection. They were about spending time together, not just in the worship assembly, but also outside of the worship assembly. As a father trying to lead a family in a spiritually dangerous world, I need that. I need that. I need a lot of what Luke is talking about here. I need God's family. I need you. I need the people in this room. I need for my family to be connected with the people in this room. I need for my family to be connected with the shepherds in this room. I need that. I need for my family to be close with the five men who shepherd this church because I know those men love my family and they will help my family. Me and my family get wisdom and they'll counsel us on how to have a godly family like they have. I need these shepherds. I need to be connected with all the seasoned disciples in this room. I need for me and my family to be connecting with the other younger families in this room. We're blessed here at Monta Vista to have a lot of young families, married people with kids, and I need for my family to be connecting with your family. I need it. I need for me and my family to lean on, on your family. I need to be praying with your family. We need to be praying with your family. We need to be encouraging each other. We need to be trying to lift each other up and give each other counsel because we're all, we both got the same goal. We're, we're both trying to get families to heaven, right? I need that. And I especially need for my kids to be connecting with your kids. I need for my kids to be connecting with other kids here of like precious faith. I need for my kids to have good friends, godly friends, friends who love God, love Jesus, love the Bible. I need for them to have a godly influence. I need for them to have other young people that they can lean on and call and text whenever they're, they're facing challenges in their lives. You see, we're spiritually going to secure our families in a dark and dangerous world. If we're going to give them the best opportunity to be productive in the kingdom of God, if we're going to give them the best chance to go to heaven, then we got to stay connected to so many things. We got to stay connected to God, one another, the members of our family, our blessings, and especially God's people. Doing these things, I believe, will help us firmly root our family in Jesus. It will help us firmly root our marriages in Jesus, our parenting in Jesus. And if you're not married, and if you don't have kids or grandkids, these things will help you root your individual life in Jesus Christ. In fact, as Brother Brian said as he concluded his lesson this morning, maybe you realize that you're not part of the greatest family there is, which is God's family. You've heard me say this many times before, and I'm going to say it again. You don't have to be married to go to heaven. You don't have to have kids or even grandkids to go to heaven. You can go to heaven as a single person, but you can't expect to go to heaven without being part of God's family. You have to be adopted into the family of God, and that process takes place through faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, and baptism for remission of sins. Brother Sal was adopted into God's family this past week. He has a family now, and if that's what you need, if you need to be part of God's family, then we'll help you with that right here and right now as we stand and we sing together. Come to the front.